I wanted to say, uh, first of all, thank you to the Royal Opera House for hosting us here today. But Judith is one of our most highly regarded opera composers. And, you know, she's created new work for uh, companies that include English National Opera here at the ROH and the Bregenz Festival, Scottish Opera. And her work has also been uh, produced and presented in many opera houses around the world. Um, and in fact, opera has spanned across your career as a composer. If you're going back to um, a work like King Harold's Saga, um, which I don't know if any of you are familiar with, but it's, uh, it's described as being an epic historical opera in three acts, dramatising a cast of thousands, including the Norwegian army. Um, a piece that tells the story of King Harold Hadradi's failed invasion of England in 1066 for solo soprano, who sings all the parts, and the whole thing lasts for about ten minutes. Um, Judith's most recent foray and opera was um, the work Miss Fortune, which was presented at Bregenz and then here at the ROH. Um, and I should say also, I, I, I realised uh, this morning that I think my first um, full-scale opera by a living composer that I went to was in fact Blonde Eckbert. <laughs> <laughs> I suddenly worked out. But um, Judith, I was, uh, I was, it would be very interesting to talk a bit about, and obviously now you're, you're working in many big houses internationally, but obviously that didn't, you didn't spring into that fully formed. And I, I just wondered, if it would be helpful to hear you talk a bit about how you kind of got going with opera in the first place. Y yes, I think that's right, Susanna. Um, eventually, these things do take on a momentum of their own, but it seems much more appropriate, I think, today to talk a bit about taking early steps. Um, nevertheless, if I go back 35 years or whatever it is, in a sense that the um, world of opera has done an 180 degree turn or 360, uh, just in your introduction, you've mentioned all the things going on. When I emerged from college or was, was still there, um, really, new music had nothing to do with opera at all. Thinking today about major progressive composers, including George Benjamin, uh, Lachenmann, Sherino, even Ferniho has written an opera which has been staged. Um, that just couldn't have happened in the early and mid 70s. It was opera was a conservative form which almost no one who was a progressive composer was working in. And um, I suppose the forms that were important to us young people at those times, things like happenings, performance art, um, community arts, which is what I did when I left college. And um, I think. A large number of people like me were just working in very informal fields of that kind, um, mainly just to do for something to do and to work with each other. And again, very different from now in that nobody knew we were doing these projects. There was nothing like a kind of feed into a, a world of maybe doing a small project with a company. We were just doing these things, uh, and all sorts of people were developing all, all kinds of work. Um, it was years before my work got anywhere near an opera company, and I think eventually the way it happened was that I did several pieces, stage works in schools. Um, I remember some of these were not, <coughs> as I sometimes think are today, rather worthy educational things. I can remember us doing a very groovy thing with uh, slide project projections in a school hall in the Isle of Wight, and uh, a series of things like that. And eventually, it was through that route, I wrote a children's opera which was seen by someone from a company which then existed called Kent Opera. And it was then that I did have one of those electric strokes of luck because uh, someone rather more eminent had pulled out of a project and uh, I was put into it. And as, as it says in the famous play, readiness is all. I was certainly ready by then to uh, leap in and, and do that. But my point is that, looking back now on that time, I think that was all entirely good. It worries me a little bit today to think that one would focus towards this word opera all the time, when opera is, I don't want to start a boring discussion of what opera is, but um, that there's a very, very wide field which consists of working together with music and other art forms. And um, to my own students, uh, is, my advice is just always to do whichever project you can see your way to doing. And I think doing the projects yourself is very important. Again, I think a thing that's happened over the last years has been a 
dramatic increase in what, what I suppose we call production values, very much better design, just much posher stuff, even on a small scale, than we used to see. But uh, as someone starting out, I don't think you should be at all concerned about that, um, those design values and so on. It, that's not really the, the big problem when, when you begin. So um, I think really that, that, that brings me to the end of my, my answer, um, that uh, I think it's wonderful now that there are so many, shall we say, routes that, that take young composers towards opera. But um, yeah, it, for me, that's just part of a much wider field. And um, perhaps the, the, the final thing I would say is that what I always do when thinking about new projects is to think, well, why should this be, why should this involve music? Is there a good reason why a piece about this thing should be done in a musical way? And I've realized that in asking myself that question, that sort of is the opera, that is the piece uh, to, to put yourself through that, that process. The end. Thank you. <laughs> Fantastic. Thank you so much. And so I'm, I'm sure we'll come back to a number of points okay. that you've raised in that. It was, um, but let's, let's move on for now to Laura, um, who another composer, and also a mezzo. So it's quite a big, actually quite interesting to hear at some stage about your <coughs> kind of role as a performer in this, because you bring quite an interesting perspective from that, in that, um, from, from that side as well. Um, as I mentioned earlier, Laura is currently one of Sound and Music's embedded composers in residence, having just started uh, work with the lovely Manchester Camerata. Um, so it's great you can be here today. Um, and one of the reasons we're very keen to have Laura as part of this panel is that uh, one of the many strings to your bow is that you have started your own opera company, Size Zero Opera. And I think it'd be quite interesting to talk, if you're happy to talk a bit about what led you to mm -hmm. set up your own company and what you're trying to do with it, that you feel that, that you have to create your own, you know, creating a company is a big step. What was behind your feeling that you need to, you need to create Size Zero Opera because something, something maybe isn't happening? Um, well, the first thing to say is it was a very organic development from the beginning. Right. Um, it wasn't like I sat down one day and said, right, I'm going to start an opera company. Um, it basically started with, I wrote during my undergraduate degree, a 30-minute music theatre work for myself to perform as a mezzo uh, with an 11-piece chamber ensemble. And we performed this work in Stoke-on-Trent, where I'm from, in schools in Staffordshire, alongside lots of educational talks I was giving in the schools. Um, and then... I got invited to perform this work at the Tete -tet Opera Festival, um, the year that I was moving to London to do my master's degree. And suddenly I had all of this panic about actually getting all of these people to London and paying everyone and managing to get the set there and all of those realisations and also the fact that Bill Banks-Jones said, what's the name of your company? <laughs> and I didn't have a name. <laughs> so I said, well okay, we'll call it Size Zero Opera. <laughs> it was literally a split-second decision, the name of the company. Um, and so from that point when we performed there, we've performed at the festival um, every year since then. And sometimes it's been my own work and sometimes it's been other composers' work. Um, and also we've been lucky enough to perform and do residencies elsewhere and abroad. Um, but from that point on, I realised that I wanted to not only perform my own work from that first performance that we did, that I wanted to create the opportunity to, for other emerging composers to write new opera because it's kind of a closed door to emerging composers and it almost feels like there's no way in. Um, and I felt that, you know, you may get to 36 and you've written 10 orchestral works and 15 million chamber works, you've never written an opera, then you get an opera commission. Um, and it's a completely different world. So the way that... Uh, I function with size zero opera is I have lots of young composers approaching me and normally the first thing that I ask them is uh, who's your favorite playwright and a lot of the time they say I don't know <laughs> so I say well go to the theater and then come back to me in 12 months <laughs> um, because basically what I want size zero opera to be is an opportunity for these composers to work they have a 12-month development process where they meet we have the designers directors, lighting designers, and everyone on board from right at the beginning so that they can learn as they go as they're writing the opera, so that they can consider all the technical um, restrictions or things that they need to think about in that sense and that they can have quite different to what you were saying, Oliver, about like having the director on board from the beginning. But I think it's quite useful for emerging composers and emerging artists to have this. And then it kind of grew one step further, which was to have 
you know, we'd make sure that it was all emerging vocalists and opera singers, um, because there's also not that much opportunity for them to perform new opera in, you know, a professional environment and be able to take on leading roles that they can then invite um, whoever they want to perform for to these performances. So now it's become like a general emerging artists, opera creators, collective thing. <laughs> um, and from th what I feel very lucky about with Size Zero Opera is that when I go and see so... I, I actually confess I go to see a lot more theatre than concerts. I generally find concerts a little bit dull. <laughs> um, so for me, I found that when I was going to see straight theatre plays, that I was always far more excited and I could see a lot more risks being taken. And so, and then I find myself going to the opera and I think no one's taking any risks. And I realized that in size zero opera, it being emerging, you know, emerging artists, that we were kind of in a position where we could take those risks and it wouldn't be detrimental because we're all emerging. <laughs> so we can get away with making a few mistakes. Um, so I feel very lucky in the sense that now Size Zero Opera is kind of developing to that point where we've got a very good audience following and more and more people are becoming involved and we're getting more and more funding that we can still take those risks without it jeopardising what actually we want to do. Fantastic. Um, <coughs> there's a few questions I was going to ask, but in fact I wonder actually if I might just lead straight into Jonathan because what you're talking about also, I, I, the... And there's a couple of really interesting, well, there's many interesting points in that. And there's a very interesting point both about actually, it picks up on something Julia said about the time it takes. So actually people do need to have that chance to experiment, to take some risks and not suddenly get an opera commission at the age of whatever and, and, and not really having had that chance to really get mm -hmm. that collaborative experience. Um, and also there's something about the kind of, the limited opportunities to, to have that experience. Um, and this, of course, leading on to Jonathan, is something that Jonathan now is very involved with in his work at Auburn Music. Um, and uh, although, in fact, your experience of commissioning operas and sort of bringing teams together in that way goes back many more years than, um, to Almeida Theatre in particular, where I'm, I, and I, I remember as I was getting going in new music, one of the things I used to really love doing was every summer there'd be this amazing series of um, contemporary operas um, at the Almeida, and I used to go to lots of them. And in fact, I remember the first time I met you, I was begging you for a ticket to go and see David Lang's puppet opera, Judith and Holofernes, which in fact you gave me. So that, that was a, a good beginning. <laughs> <laughs> um, so I think it would be... I, I, one of the things that Jonathan begins, brings into this is that kind of sense of perspective over many different ways of creating new work and also the importance of risk-taking. So, and Jonathan, I'd almost want you to kind of respond to some of what you've heard so far and mm. to talk about your perspectives as well. Yeah, um, no, I will. And I'm, I'm, really I'm really sorry if I say some really obvious things, but um, one of the things I've learned over the years of being involved in new opera is a lot of very obvious things don't get thought about. And since I think most of you are here because you're interested in writing opera, um, I, I apologise in advance. And I'm, I'm, I'm kind of really interested in what Laura was just saying and uh, about places to make opera and ways to approach it. And I first came across new opera when I worked at Glyndebourne. Uh, I was very lucky to be involved in a production of Nigel Osborne opera with Peter Sellers. And of course, working with someone like Peter Sellers, he's one of those rare people who can turn an opera company upside down and get them to do something that they'd never do otherwise. And again, work, putting on new opera, the Almeida was a very liberating place to do it because it was a theatre that did opera, not an opera house that did new opera. Uh, and therefore, some of the, and I apologise to colleagues here from opera companies, <laughs> but some of the restrictions you find in opera companies, um, I, I, I've been lucky enough not to experience. What do I mean by that? Well, opera companies, particularly bigger opera companies, are basically set up to perform the, the major repertoire operas. And in order to do that, they have a kind of organisational company structure that really has a, a very strong musical backbone. And that's, that's very obvious and very important. But of course, if you're trying to do something new, or you're trying to innovate with the form, then you need to hear the voice of the theatre as well and the voice of the writer. And I think... Often, in thinking about new opera, those are parts of it that get quite lost. Um, Judith talked about the kind of historical perspective. 
And, and the other point about the historical perspective um, is that historically, composers learnt how to write operas by, by writing them, not getting them right, and then writing more operas. Um, but sadly, we live in a world today where you probably won't get the opportunity to do that. If you don't get it right very quickly early on, you probably won't get asked to write another one, which is why the kind of pre-planning bit is, is really, really important. Um, Laura was saying, go and see masses of theatre. I wholeheartedly endorse that. Uh, I'd also add, if you, if you get a chance, write music for the theatre, because... If you do that, it'll be the, the theatre that's driving the music you write. And that's a really important um, skill for a composer to have. Because, of course, when you write an opera, you're not writing a piece of music. You are writing a piece of music and you are creating a piece of theatre. And it's amazing how many composers um, don't, don't see that clearly enough. Also, do see lots of opera. Uh, it's incredible how many young composers want to write operas, but actually they've hardly seen any operas. Um, and really interrogate your, your motivation. And, and Judith, again, touched on this. She said something like, why should this piece, um, this piece of theatre involve music? Um, and it's, it's really important. Why do you want to write an opera? It's not just another kind of part of the compose a career choice, you know, I've written a quartet, I want to write a symphony, I want to write a song cycle. It is a different, it is a different form. Um, and also, the kind of pre-opera writing, pre-planning stage, uh, do really try and get as much understanding of the voice as you can, and do try and write pieces of music for the voice. Do write songs, because of course, a really important part of opera is telling a story through song. Um, and again, it's amazing how many people try and write operas without actually having had much experience of the human voice. Um, so that's a lot of thinking about to do before you even begin <laughs> to think about what the piece might be, what, what your opera might be. Um, and you'll be realising this by, the, by this point, it's a very complex art form. It's much more complex than any other form of music making that you'll be involved with because it just involves, it, it's got so many more components. And of course the crucial thing for a composer is it's a collaboration. And it's a collaboration that goes far further than any other type of collaboration you'll have as a composer. I mean, you, you may collaborate with a conductor or a singer or a, or a musician. Um, but this, is, this goes far beyond that. Uh, and collaborating with someone, with other artists in this way is a, a profoundly different way of working. So when you get to that point, when you've done all that sort of pre-thinking, um, the planning, the idea, um, where does the idea come from? Um, well, it might come from an existing text, in which case, why should that text become an opera? I think we've also heard a little bit about that. Martin, I thought, was really interesting about the music that you find within existing plays or existing poems. Uh, I think a very common mistake is you come across a play that feels very musical, and therefore you think it's a very good candidate for an opera. And I think probably the opposite is true. <laughs> um, and I really liked what Martin was saying about his example about vertigo. Um, because actually I often say to composers, go and find a play that doesn't work as a play. Because <laughs> maybe what it needs is music to, to make it successful. Um, I mean, one example of that, I commissioned many years ago a piece um, called The Cenci by Giorgio Battistelli, which is based on a very famous but quite flawed play by Artaud. Uh, and he felt that by adding music to it, he could make, he could make this piece, this play, really, really work. Um, thinking about what, having a sense of what the piece, of what the piece might be. Do you? I mean, some composers can feel a certain atmosphere that they want to find in an opera, or um, a particular action. I mean, there are lots of different ways of of telling stories. Usually opera is about telling stories at some level, not necessarily, um, but trying to have a, trying to get some kind of sense, some reference point to what you might want to do. I mean, it's very useful sometimes 
having seen lots of operas, to just think about the two or three that you really like, whether they're contemporary operas or classical operas, and try and analyse why, why those pieces work for you. Um, choosing a librettist is, is, is a crucial thing, and we've heard a bit about that. Um, apologies to Martin for using the word. I'm just, just being lazy, really. <laughs> But finding a writer, it's a really skilled thing, writing text for opera. Don't just... Uh, somebody said... Um, oh, yeah, you, you said it's amazing how many composers don't know about mm -hmm. any plays. Similarly, for very understandable reasons, not many composers know many writers. Don't just start writing an opera with a friend you met in the pub <laughs> because they're the only writer you know. Um, because writing music, writing text for music is a very skilled and specialist thing. And Martin's a very rare animal in that respect because he seems to really understand the difference between his day job as a playwright um, and his job moonlighting as a, as a, as a writer for opera. Um, although I suspect in the future it's going to be more than moonlighting in his case. Um, so really try and get advice at that point, uh, if you can. There are lots of places where you can get advice, where you can meet writers. Uh, there's a lot of good work that's done here. We do a lot in Albrough, Music Theatre Wales. Uh, if possible, try and meet several writers, even try and do some small little collaborations with them. Um, because it's not just the writing, the quality of the writing that matters. Uh, it's also the human being that you're going to be working with. And sometimes you might love someone's writing, but as a human being you might not get on, or vice versa. Um, and also, very early on, uh, as Ollie was touching upon, thinking about the role of the director, the producer, perhaps the conductor, um, try and get people involved very early on who've, who've been involved in creating other, other new pieces because they can help you negotiate some of the very obvious and, and easily e and pitfalls that one can very easily fall into. Um, and also, I think very early on, just thinking a little bit about your audience. Who are they going to be? What, what, what might you want to be saying to them? Um, what kind of experience might you want them to have? Um, I don't believe that it's the role of the artist to kind of be sitting there thinking, how can I please my audience? Uh, but I do believe that you need to, to think at some point about the audience, and that's probably one point we haven't touched upon um, so far. Um, it was really interesting hearing Martin describe his collaboration with George. Uh, every single collaboration between a composer and writer is different, um, so there are absolutely no, no rules about it. Um, Martin's point about texts being far too long, I think it was Martin who said that, yes. Uh, very, very common mistake. Very common mistake is that someone writes a libretto and in fact they've written a play. Um, and then there are a lot of very important technical things. I've touched upon the voice a bit. Um, there are, I mean, I'm not an expert here. Judith could tell you much more and Laura about the sort of many technical aspects of writing opera, um, how, you, how you balance voices, for example, against ensemble. Um, there are a lot of very simple technical rules, really, that you need to follow. Um, again, a very basic thing is thinking about which text do I mind being heard and which text do I not mind being heard. It's, it's extraordinary how many operas are written without that thought. Um, and, uh, and then you actually you end up not being able to hear any of the text. Um, and also, again, because it's the longest piece of music you'll ever write, uh, there's a really, it's really important to think about architecture. I think some, I mean, everybody writes music in different ways. Some composers just start at the beginning and then they end at the end, and they don't plan. But if you don't plan an opera, um, it, 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 can, it can lead to many, many problems. So, so the architecture is very important. I've known opera composers to kind of paint or draw their, their operas, um, sometimes using colour, sometimes using shapes. Others 
create kind of beautiful graphs, um, but thinking really precisely about, about the different dramatic moments or the different highs and lows that you want. Um, because as we've said before, you're, you're creating a piece of theatre as, well as, as, as well as a piece of music. Um, we've touched upon the value of, wor of workshopping and editing, um, but again, there are no rules about this. Some great operas are written just by a composer sitting down and writing it and then delivering it and then it's performed and other great operas are written um, via years and years of careful workshopping. So again, no, no rules there. Um, and, then, and then finishing off, obviously, Ollie's talked about about the a bit about the role of the director. We haven't heard about the role of the conductor really, um, but of course one of the things, one of the curious things about opera is that uh, usually the, the 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 librettist will have created a piece, and then in a sense they hand that over to the composer. And although there might be a, a strong dialogue after that point, um, it then in many ways becomes the composer's the composer's baby. But of course there's a point when the composer has to hand that over to a director and a conductor um, and slightly sit back and, and let them take, take the lead. And that kind of references back to my early point about, about the collaborative nature uh, of opera, um, which is something that you know, does not suit all temperaments. Um, so those, that's a kind of very quick overview. It's a bit kind of checklisty, and I apologise for that. <laughs> I apologise again for saying some very obvious things there, but, but I, I think it's really important. And writing an opera will take up more of your life than anything else you've ever done. <laughs> so, so for goodness sake, um, get it right. <laughs> <laughs>